Hey everybody, welcome to your free GMAT prep hour. It is May 17th, 2020. I will be your host for the evening, Reed Arnold. Um, excited to have you here. Those of you that are here live and those of you that are watching the YouTube video later on, welcome. If you are looking for some free prep options, we have a few more offerings available to you other than this series. We try to do one of these every two weeks or so. Uh, but if you are looking for other options, you can take a free class from our, of ours. Uh, we have a nine week course and you can take it as a live class. At the moment, we don't have any live classes on account of the pandemic, but you can take an online class. You can take the first class uh, of our nine week course for free, no questions asked. All you have to do is sign up and test it out. See, see what the vibe is, see if you like it, see if it's something you think is gonna help you. Um, I, I say this every time we talk about some major stuff in class one, so you, there's really no reason not to do it. Uh, and you can try it a few different teachers, see which, see which one fits you best. Uh, you can also sample our interactive on-demand course. That's a video course. It's a really, really great program. Much like the test, it adapts to you as you go through the session. So if you get a question right, it will divert you down a path where you will get a harder question. If you get a question wrong, it will help you get an easier question and build back up. A uh, really, really neat program. You can try that out for free as well. We also have a free practice test. Uh, no matter uh, if you take a class or not, you can take one of our practice tests for free to see what your score is. So there are a lot of free options out there for your GMAT prep. Um, today, we are going to talk about what I consider one of, if not the most important strategies on the quant section and in, maybe on the test. Uh, it is a really useful, vital, common, strategy that you want to have just utterly knocked out. You want to know exactly how it works, exactly what to do within that strategy, exactly what to, um, uh, exactly what to do when certain diversions happen in, within that strategy. You just know how to react in the middle of the process using what we call testing cases. It's a most commonly used in data sufficiency questions on the quant, although there are some problem solving where it can be used. Uh, I'm going to speak of it today purely as a data sufficiency tactic since that is most common. Uh, on the, for those of you that don't know, there are two types of quant questions on the actual GMAT. Problem solving, that's a very standard what you think of when you think of a standardized test question. You know, solve for X. What is the perimeter of the shape? John was on a road trip. How fast was he going? That kind of stuff. That's going to be 16 to 17 of your 31 questions. The other 15, 14 or 15 are going to be what we call data sufficiency. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce what that is. For those of you that are new to this test, you'll have a sense of what's going on there, but it's a very GMAT specific, very weird kind of question. Um, within data sufficiency, the strategy testing cases can be used, quite frankly, every single question. That's not to say you should use it every single question. Sometimes it's a rather cumbersome approach. Uh, but it theoretically is an option. And so if you ever find yourself in a data efficiency question and you're not sure what to do, have that in your holster ready to draw because it is powerful, useful. Uh, it can at least help narrow down answer choices, even if it might not get you to the exact answer. It's just a really, really good thing to have in your pocket. When I took the official test, I guess it was about a year ago now, uh, they had me, my company, Manhattan Prep, had me take the test again. You know, I, I probably tested cases half the time, you know, seven questions on, on data sufficiency. Uh, if you watch me take the practice test online, Twitch the GMAT, it's, it's one of these free GMAT prep hours, you will see me test cases many, many times. It's, a, it's just super, super common. Uh, and it's also a thorn at, in an instructor's side because it is one of those things we talked about in class one, one of those huge, huge strategies in class one. And I'm, I've, I've taught this for years now. And it always seems that we talk about it in class one, and there's always, always that class where we come back in class four or five and we have a kind of a refresher on it. And it seems like people aren't really working to understand it. And I kind of emphasize like, this is really important. You need to understand this. Uh, and then we come back at the end of the course in class nine and I check to make sure they really understand it. And lo and behold, they don't. And I reemphasize, you have got to understand this. This is huge for this test. Um, and, and so it's one of, those, one of those times where I feel like we have to have a clear like, come to come to Jesus moment to, to use the phrase uh, where it's like we sit down and we say like learn this for God's sakes learn this if you're going to take this test you have to know how to do this and so this is kind of the resource I want to use for the future to point people to like I need to 
practice testing cases I'm going to show in this video at least to introduce and, and deepen their understanding of how this works. Okay, so that is testing cases. First off, let's reintroduce data sufficiency for people who have not seen uh, or new to the test or aren't totally clear on what data sufficiency is. Data sufficiency is a twist on the standardized test questions you're used to seeing. You will always have a question up front. It will give you some information sometimes, but it will always ask some questions. So this one says, at a certain work conference, how many of the employees were senior managers? I'm ostensibly trying to answer that question. I then will get two statements about the scenario. Statement one tells me that of those employees who attended, 80% were senior managers. Statement two tells me, that, uh, tells me that of those who attended, 64 were not senior managers. And then I will get these five answer choices. They are always the same answer choices. They are always phrased in the same way. They are always in the same order. So you eventually will want to have them memorized. Okay. Uh, what these answer choices do is mention some combinations of statement one and two uh, that could tell me, or not could, do tell me what the answer to the question is. Where if I knew some combinations of the statements, I could answer the question, how many were senior managers in this case? So answer choice A says statement one alone is sufficient, but statement two is not. That would mean that by knowing this, I would know how many senior managers are, uh, I'm sorry, how many employees were senior managers. Now in this particular question, that is not the answer. If I know 80% were senior managers, that does not tell me how many were because I don't know how many were at the conference, okay? Uh, so answer choice A would not be correct here. Uh, state, answer choice B says statement two alone is sufficient. So that's the same idea, okay? But that would not be the case here either because this just tells me how many were not senior managers, okay? So that's out. Answer choice D says that each of them alone would tell me the answer to the question. As I've already said, since each of them alone does not, I know it's not D. In fact, I could have eliminated D as soon as I realized this one was not enough information. Uh, and then we're down to C and E. And C is when I take both of the statements and use both facts to see if it's enough to answer the question. And if it's not, then I have to choose E. In this particular case, since I know 80% were senior managers, I would know 20% are not senior managers. And since 20%, uh, and since I've told 64 are not senior managers, I would know that 20% of the audience is 64 people and that means I would multiply by five and it would be 320 total people and I could get 80 percent of that to get the answer well all that math I don't need to do uh, because it's not actually about answering the question it's about knowing I could answer the question and so I would know if I knew 80 percent were senior managers and 64 were not I know that that's enough information to answer the question that is asked so the answer here would be C okay uh, I have a question in the chat here. When doing testing cases, does it make sense for one to attempt to use the same test case in statement two that they use in statement one? Absolutely, yes. If you can reuse a case, do it. If it fits both situations, and that's what we're talking about today, quite frankly, is fitting the situations that they give you. Um, you you wanna reuse, case, and sometimes if you can't exactly reuse it, you can just change it a little bit. So you don't have to keep concocting new cases. That can be one of the more strenuous parts of testing cases. Um, so yeah, reuse if you can, for sure. All right, that's, that's a, that is a really handy thing to do. In fact, I would highly recommend it. And also just so you know, we're not gonna talk much about this today, but the cases you often need to test are not going to be phenomenally difficult cases. They're, you can do most testing cases with like negative five to five. Those tend to be enough to answer the question that is asked. Sometimes you might have to go to like perfect squares, 25, 36, or prime numbers, 11, 13, whatever, but it's really pretty straightforward numbers that answer these questions by and large. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Choking on my own saliva. That's hot. Um, before we dive into this, I have kind of an unusual arc to the lesson today. I'm gonna first, we're gonna warm up, and I'm gonna point out to you how often and how quickly you do things that are really like testing cases um, and how often you actually use the reasoning that testing cases employs. Uh, and then I'm gonna go from that like very real world kind of straightforward stuff. I'm gonna jump into the highly abstract world. We're gonna go to like a very bizarre place with testing cases for a second. And then we're gonna weave back into GMAT land and do some actual problems and show how, uh, show how the abstract logic applies and how it's, what is underneath all of the data sufficiency questions that use testing cases, okay? So as we're up here, I just want you to take 
um, a, a minute or two uh, and to answer these questions. I've put down here the answer box to remind you what the answers are, 1210, okay? But these are not math, not GMAT questions, just pure data efficiency questions uh, that you could theoretically answer using testing cases reasoning. All right, so the expected answers to these warm-up questions would be something like uh, C, A, E, and B. Okay, so first off, are there any questions about why these answers are what they are? If not, I want you to think about why the answers are what they are. And I know that seems maybe obvious, but what reasoning is done to make these answers the answers? Why, why is that combination of statements sufficient? Or in the case of number C, letter C, why are they not sufficient? Yeah, we'll talk about the last one. I think that'll be an interesting one. Someone said in the question, why uh, do all animals in the Arctic have white fur? I don't think they do. Okay, so for, for this first one, I don't think all animals in the Arctic have white fur, but I do think the bears that live in the Arctic do have white fur, they're polar bears. I mean, I guess, here's the thing, this is not pure, right? This is not a pure, uh, pure logic, right? So could there be a, a polar bear with a genetic defect that actually makes it not have white fur, but maybe, and maybe polar bears don't have white fur when they're born, in which case you're putting on a good GMAT skepticism hat. But I meant for these answer to be C, because polar bears have white fur. If it's a bear and it lives in the Arctic, it's a polar bear. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know of any, there's no other species of bear that lives in the Arctic. And so putting aside the possibility of, of genetic mutations that make a polar bear not have white fur, polar bears have white fur. Um, and that's the, the, the purpose of this. And we'll see, we'll see why I'm using this example here in a second. I know that there might be some real world exceptions to this. Okay. Um, indeed. So a lot of questions about why is the last one B? That's fair. Um, JD asks, for the first, I thought E because the bear that typically lives in the Arctic. If indeed in the Arctic, it's going to have white fur, but maybe it's not in the Arctic and thus brown. Um, I meant a species that lives in the Arctic. And the reason I said that was because it's like, we take polar bears and put them in zoos sometimes, you know? So I, I just, I just, that was meant to be a real world, like, look, it's a species that comes from the Arctic and it's a bear, right? What kind of, what color fur does it have? And the answer is white barring a genetic mutation, which is just not the point of the exercise. Um, 
So it doesn't matter if it does not matter if there are other species in the Arctic that don't have white fur when I take these two together, because I'm only thinking about bears. Okay. I'm thinking about bears from the Arctic. They have white fur. Okay. Uh, is animal P a mammal? Well, if it is a bear, it is a mammal. I don't know what kind of bear. I don't know where it's from. Who cares? It's a mammal. So that would be sufficient to know it's a mammal. There are species that live in the Arctic that are not mammals. Not many, surprisingly, but at least based on a quick cursory research, but some birds do live in the, in the Arctic, uh, at least for much of the year. Um, and so that would not be a mammal. Um, C is my favorite because my goodness, how repetitive is that formula? I love it every time, who doesn't? But the, the I want to go see the world and the stubborn father who says, no, you can't, it's dangerous. And then they meet some rapscallion and go out on an adventure. Man, does Disney have that formula down. There are several movies that fit this criteria. It's impossible to know which. Uh, so the question, uh, the biggest question right now is D, why is this answer B? And the problem is we don't know what kind of star Procyon B is, right? Like who, who here is an astronomer? Maybe someone does, but I sure didn't. Um, and I wouldn't expect you to, but it would be enough information to know. Like if, if I asked you this question, and I said, I want you to answer this question, what kind of star is Sirius B? But you're not allowed to look up Sirius B. You're, that's verboten, that's not the game. But I will tell you it's the same kind of star as Procyon B. What could you do? You could go look up what Procyon B is and see what kind of star it is, and Sirius B would be the same kind. The fact that we didn't know what kind of star Procyon B is, that's not the same thing as it being insufficient information. It is sufficient information. We just need to supply the knowledge to compare Procyon B to whatever kind of star it is and then say that that is the same as Sirius B, okay? It is, a log it is logically sufficient information. It might not be sufficient because we don't know what Procyon B is, but that's not the point. Insufficient doesn't mean I don't know. It means I can't possibly know it's not enough to know, whereas it is enough to know that Sirius B is the same kind of star as Procyon B. Okay. Okay. Um, we would have to, yeah, I mean, so, so the comments here are on this form. Yes, we don't know what Procyon B is. It does not tell us what kind of star Procyon B is, but this would be enough information if we knew Procyon B, that uh, Sirius B is a white dwarf star. We would look up Procyon B, it's a white dwarf. Oh, Sirius B must be a white dwarf. This is about logical sufficiency, right? And the fact that we might not know all the facts doesn't mean a statement is logically insufficient. Now, here's the real question here. What is going on? What logic are we doing to determine if some combination of information is correct? I want you all to think about that for, for a second or two. So I see a comment that says, yeah, and so this is, again, this is not pure GMAT stuff, but there are several kinds of dwarf stars. This isn't a perfect example, but you'll see the point here in a second. Jenna, you say it's an opinion. What, what do you mean this is an opinion? It's opinion comma choice. How do you mean? Like this basic trope about a female lived in a pretty isolated place where uh, the you know wants to explore the world and the father says no that fits Aladdin that fits the Little Mermaid I think it even fits Beauty and the Beast it fits Moana more recently um, it fits all these possible things and since I don't know which one it is I can't answer the question which one are you going to watch I don't know there are thousands of these movies apparently. Yeah, this is, again, this is, this is not, we're, we're, we're maybe spending too much time on this. Uh, but, so someone says I'm using inductive logic to prove or disprove data sufficiency questions and statements. Um, I've honestly forgotten the difference between inductive and deductive logic. What we are doing is taking these statements 
and considering what possibilities there are under those statements. And determining if those possibilities is enough to answer the question that is asked. The statements constrain us, they give us worlds we must live in, right? We must, we must be stuck in a world where animal P is a bear. That's our world. And so now we're thinking about bears. And we might think, well, is it a grizzly bear or is it a polar bear? Because if it's a grizzly bear, it has brown fur. And if it's a polar bear, it has white fur. So I can't answer the question. It's not enough just to know it's a bear. I have to know what kind of bear. I have to know if it's a polar bear. Notice what you're not wondering though. You're not wondering, well, maybe it's a bear or maybe it's a chameleon or maybe it's a fox or I don't know, maybe it's an earthworm. You are accepting always that this is a bear. You are living in the world of, okay, this thing's a bear. Does that mean it has white fur? Okay. Same thing here. You're not thinking about, well, it could live in the Arctic, but maybe it lives in the Bahamas. Eh. No, you're wondering about animals that live in the Arctic. Okay. And you're wondering if that is enough to hone in, to hone in what is asked. Okay. So to visualize this, we're going to put this to visualization here. This question asks, is animal P a mammal? So we're in the world of all the animals. That's the yellow world. We're going to not pay too much attention to that, but that's all the animals. In that world of animals, there's this little subset called mammals. And we want to know if animal P is in the mammal subset or if it's not a mammal, if it's just another kind of animal, a bird, a lizard, whatever. Statement one tells me animal P is a bear. Well, if I know that P is a bear, and I know this, I don't have to look this up, but I know that bears are a subset of mammals. Okay, I know that the, the red circle is part of the blue circle. Then, okay, P is in the blue circle. It's in the red circle, so it must be in the blue circle because the entire red circle fits in the blue circle. If I'm told that animal P lives in the Arctic, okay, that, let's think about the circle of animals that live in the Arctic. Well, some of them are mammals. Caribou, narwhal whales, polar bear, Arctic wolves, whatever. They live, in the Ar they live in the Arctic and they are mammals. But there are some species of birds that live in the Arctic that are not mammals. And so since I don't know which side of the green circle I'm on, if I'm in the mammal inter intersection or if I'm outside, I can't say that this is enough information to answer the question that is asked. Okay. And so we're going to do now a, a very experimental, very bizarre, abstract question set. Okay, this is going to be very abstract. Here's the question. Okay, what I want you to think about here, if, it, if it's just a single colored circle, that is a fact. Like that's just something that we, we are told. If it's an a intersection or a circle within a circle, that is a relationship. Okay, so we'll do this first one together so you have a sense of, of what I mean. That, that, that will help, okay. I wanna know, are we in a blue circle? Statement one tells me we're in a red circle. Well, okay, but are we in a blue circle? I don't know if red circles are in blue circles. So that's not sufficient. I get rid of A and D. Statement two tells me that red circles are in blue circles. But I don't know if I'm in a red circle. That's statement one. I have to forget statement one for a second. So I don't know if I'm in a blue circle because I don't know if I'm in a red circle, I'm just told that red circles are in blue circles. But when I bring the two together, this is the logic that we just saw. I'm in a blue circle. I'm a bear. Bears are a part of mammals. Okay. It's not quite the same because that would be a fact we would know to be true. But um, 
since the red circle is in the blue circle and I'm told that I have a red circle, I'm in the red circle, then I must be in the blue circle. So the answer to this question here would be C. Okay. So because a red circle, because I'm told a red circle is in blue circles and I'm told that we are in the red circle. Why not B, Jenna? Because what this symbol means is that red circles fit in blue circles. It doesn't say we're in the red circle or in the blue circle. Okay. Anytime there's two circles overlapping in any way, uh, that symbol means this is the relationship between these two circles. It doesn't mean we are in one of those circles. If you're given just a single color circle, that means we're in a red, like we are in a red circle. That's what this means. This says the red circle is in the blue circle, but I have to forget that I'm in the red circle because I'm treating this alone right now. And then when I bring the two together, oh, I'm in a red circle, the red circle's in the blue circle, I'm in the blue circle. So I could say C. Okay. So try to take, uh, take two minutes or so, two, three minutes, and see if you can work on the other four questions here. All right, so that's about three minutes. Let's talk this through. Organization here is a little strange. I, I formatted this unusually, but the second question here is meant to be this one. I want to know if I'm in a blue circle. Well, statement one tells me I'm in a red circle. Okay, am I in a blue circle? I don't know. Statement two tells me that red circles and blue circles intersect a little bit here. Okay, but which one am I? I don't know where I am. And then I bring the two together and I'm in a red circle. So am I in the blue circle or not? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm here in the red circle or here in the red circle. All I know is I'm in the red circle. And so since I don't know where I am, I can't say I'm in the blue circle or not. I would have to say E, no sufficiency. Okay, that would not be enough to answer if I'm in a blue circle or not. Letter C, 
asks, am I in a blue circle? Statement one says I'm in a red circle, but okay, am I in a blue circle? Statement two says the blue circles fit inside the red circles. Okay, but am I, where, you know, where am I? I still don't know where I am. And when I bring the two together, same issue. I know I'm in the red circle, but am I here in the red circle or am I here in the red circle? That would be insufficient. I would have to say E. Okay. D says if red circles fit in blue circles, do I have a blue, am I in a blue circle? Well, statement one tells me I'm in a red circle. Well, I'm told that red circles are part of blue circles. And so if I'm in a red circle, I must be in the blue circle. So that would be sufficient. Statement two says I'm in a green circle and green circles are in the red circles. So if I'm in a green circle, then I'm in a red circle. And if I'm in a red circle, I'm in a blue circle. So, uh, so the answer here would be D. In either situation, I know I'm in a blue circle. Okay. And last but not least, E says, if, uh, if I'm in a blue circle, am I in a red circle? Okay. If I'm in a blue circle, am I in a red circle? This statement one tells me I'm in a green circle and the green and the blue circle intersect like this. Well, since I'm in a green circle and I'm in a blue circle, I must be here in this intersection. I need a different color so that it's a little bit cleaner here. I must be in this intersection of green and blue here in the middle. And you might notice that the red circle isn't part of that intersection. And so I actually have enough information to answer the question. Am I in a red circle? No. And on data sufficiency, a no is sufficient. So I know that the statement one is sufficient because I know I'm not in a red circle. I'm somewhere in this intersection of green and blue. Statement two says I'm in a yellow circle and here's the relationship of yellow and blue circles. Well, since I'm in a yellow circle, and I'm in a blue circle, I'm in the intersection. And notice here the difference, some red is there. I could be in a red circle or I could be outside a red circle. Okay, and so this would be insufficient. The answer here would be A. Now I know this is very abstract and very strange. We're about to type to the GMAT, I promise. We'll see examples of what, what, what we're doing here because this is what's going on underneath testing cases and a lot of data sufficiency questions. You're not given abstract shapes, you're given mathematic facts and figures, but this is what's happening. And it's helpful to start thinking of it in, in this way. Okay. And to use that example we saw earlier, let's bring back the colored circles with the facts. So I want to know if P is in the mammal circle. Am I in the green or the blue mammal circle? Well, I'm in the red bear circle. And I know, because it's a common knowledge, that the red bear circle is in the blue mammal circle. So I must be in the mammal circle. If I'm in the Arctic circle, I might be in the mammal circle, I might not be. If we take all this together, if I'm in the bear circle, I'm in the Arctic circle, and I'm in the mammal circle, I'm a polar bear. So when would I need all of this information? When do I need to know that I'm a bear and that I'm a species that lives in the Arctic, if it's not the question that was asked. The question that was asked was, does animal P have white fur? I'm sorry, no, is animal P a mammal? That was the question here. And I actually don't need both statements. I just need to know I'm a bear. When would I need both statements? Something to the effect of what species of animal is animal P? Okay, let's go through that logic here. What species of animal is animal P? Animal P is a bear. Animal P is of a species that lives in the Arctic. Well, if we look at these sections here, if we look at the circles, okay, 
And again, this uses outside knowledge. I don't expect you to know all this about bears. But uh, if you're a bear, it turns out there are actually eight species of bear. And so am I a grizzly bear? Am I a bespectacled bear? Am I a black bear? Am I a polar bear? That's not enough to answer what species animal P is. If I'm in the green circle and I live in the Arctic, am I a caribou? Am I an Arctic wolf? It's not enough to know what species the animal is to know it lives in the Arctic. But when I take the two together, I'm in that polar bear zone. And this demonstrates the two kinds of questions. Notice these two situations have the identical statements. They have the exact same statement, statements, but different answers to the question. In this yes, no question, is animal PM mammal, it's enough to know that it's a bear. Then I know it's a mammal. In this question, it's not enough to know it's a bear to know its species. It's not enough to know it lives in the Arctic to know its species. I have to know both of those facts. And when I do, I know it's a polar bear. Okay. Because it's a different question that's being asked, but I'm given the same categories. And I'm not thinking you know, about non-bears when I'm told it's a bear. I'm not thinking about the Bahamas when I'm told it lives in the Arctic. Now, let's bring this together. What does this have to do with the GMAT? Read, why have you spent 20 minutes talking about colored circles? Here's a more GMAT question. And the logic, you might notice the colored circles are identical. They're in the same place. Okay. This asks, what is the value of integer x? This tells me x is prime. Okay, so I'm in the prime circle. Well, but is it three or is it seven? Is it 11? Is it 101? I don't know. That's not enough information to answer the question. If it tells me X is even, okay, is it four? Is it 100 billion? I, like, I don't know. What is that? That's not enough to answer the question. But when I take the two together, the intersection of facts, there's only one option, two. It's the only even prime. It's the only thing that fits both worlds. Conversely, if I look at this, the same statements, but the different question, is X positive? Well, statement one tells me X is prime. All prime numbers are positive. So there in the red prime circle, I'm in the blue positive circle. If I'm prime, I'm positive. So that would be sufficient. This answer is A. If I know X is even, this is a little known fact that GMAT doesn't do this that often, but technically negative numbers can be even. Negative two is even, negative four is even because I can divide them by two and be it an integer. So technically, if I know X is even, it's not enough to know if it's positive or not because maybe I'm a positive even number like four or maybe I'm a negative even number like negative eight. And so that would not be sufficient because I don't know which side of the circle I'm on, okay? And so these two questions that are totally different, this one's about bears and mammals, and Arctic species. This is about prime numbers and X and even, and they seem totally different. They are logically identical because that's what's going on underneath. I'm considering what is possible under the constraints and using logic and basic facts to get to a single answer. Okay. So that's the abs. We're gonna we're gonna pull back from the abstract now. We're gonna keep dipping back into it a little bit, but that's the abstract part. But I want you to really, I wanted you to really see how there how it's about like overlap, right? Possible worlds. Here's this world. Here's this world. Where do they intersect? What part am I in? Am I in the intersection or am I out? What's going on? Okay, because that's what testing cases is really about. So take a look at, oh, uh, don't do that question. Let's not do that question. That's a little bit of a tricky question. Let's start. Mm. There's one other, there is one other relationship I haven't quite mentioned yet. And that's if two statements mean the same thing. Two circles are actually the same. So for instance, if I wonder is in prime and I'm told it has two factors, well, those are the same circle. Numbers that are prime have two factors. Numbers that have two factors are prime. And so that's actually really, one green circle when the blue and the yellow overlap on each other. That does happen also in testing cases. But let's put this to actual GMAT questions now. 
and and we'll go away from the abstraction and dip back for some of the review. But I just want you to try testing cases. And we're going to talk about um, how this how this logic is underneath these questions, and we're going to really talk about how to best organize our testing cases process so that we work through this abstract logic clearly and organized in a repeated systematic way. Okay, so take two minutes to answer this question here. Um, and I do want you to test cases. There might be a way to not test cases. For any question we do today, try testing cases just to practice. All right, so that's two minutes, which is the average time you get to answer a quant question on the test. Go ahead, put up a final guess, even if you're not sure, you'll have to get used to guessing. So I have an A in there, a B, a B, another B. It looks like B is getting some gravity here. Okay, so let's talk about why. We want to know, is P an integer in the more abstract world? Am I in the blue circle or not? The circle of integers. Okay. Statement one puts me in the red circle of 3p is an integer. Okay. And so here's a visual representation of this situation. Okay. In the red circle are some numbers like one third, because one third times three is an integer. It's one. Three times one third is an integer. Three times 100 over three is an integer. Three times negative four third, all of these are integers. So they are all in the red circle. Okay. But they are not in the blue circle because those are worlds where P is an integer. But there are some numbers that are in both worlds, that are in both the red and the blue circle. If P is one, it's in the, it's in the red circle because three times one is an integer, it's three. And it's in the blue circle because one is an integer. Okay. If P is four, same thing. If P is 10,257, same thing. In fact, now that I think about it, that intersection is probably, yeah, I've kind of drawn the intersection incorrectly. What I should have drawn, let me, let me show you what that visualization should be. Oh, I can't, shoot. Um, I've, I've turned this into a PDF. What that visualization should be is not a Venn diagram like that. It should be the red circle of 
three p, and the blue circle is within it. And so this tells me, statement one tells me that I'm in the red circle. But that doesn't mean I'm in the blue circle. I might be in the blue circle, but I don't have to be. I could be in the red circle. Okay, so that's out. It's not statement one. Statement two tells me that P over three is an integer. Well, numbers that fit that would be numbers like three and six and 15 and 345. And every number that fits the green circle is an integer. Okay. Well, then what about numbers like five and two and 100? Those are also in the blue circle. So why would statement two be sufficient? If there are integers in the blue circle that aren't in the green circle, why would this be sufficient? It's true, JD, that five thirds is not an integer. That's true. So why is statement two sufficient if five thirds is not an integer, right? If P is five, If P equals five, well, five thirds is not an integer. So why is statement two sufficient? Because I, I wanna know if I'm in the blue, not if I'm in the green. I wanna know if being in the green is enough to tell me I'm in the blue, not if being in the blue tells me I'm in the green. I don't care if I'm in the green, really. I'm just told I have to be. I want to know if that means, am I in the blue? And since all of the green is in the blue, I'm in the blue. It doesn't matter that there's other blue out there that I'm not in because I'm in the blue anyway, because the green is part of the blue. Okay. So the answer to this one is B. Yes, there are many integers. There are many integers that don't fit this rule. Who cares? That's like going to this question about the bears and saying, well, yeah, but there are animals that are not polar bears or there are animals that are not bears. I don't want to live in the, I'm, I don't care about the world where animals are not bears. I'm in that circle. I'm told it's a bear. I only want to think about the red circle. Okay. I don't want to think about the fox circle or the, I can't even know the mammals, the deer circle or the buffalo circle. I only want to think about the bear circle right now. Okay. And that's the same thing over here. I don't want to think about circles where P over three is not an integer. I don't care. I don't care about those circles. That's like wondering if it's a wolf when I'm told it's a bear. Like, no, it's a bear. It's a bear. Be a bear. Who cares about the things that aren't bears? Yeah, they're out here. Whatever. I'm a bear. Bear. Mammals. If I'm a bear, I'm a mammal. That doesn't mean if I'm a bam mammal, I'm a bear. This is what I call sometimes square rectangle logic. You probably heard, you know, every square is a rectangle, not every rectangle is a square. That's really lurking under a lot of this stuff. It just doesn't always use squares and rectangles. Okay. So how do we organize this? Oops. Get rid of that. Cancel that out. Okay. A good way to organize your testing cases process. There are a few different tactics out there, but whatever one you use, I really highly, strongly, firmly recommend a process that keeps clear of what the case you're testing is, what the rules that have to be followed are, 
because those tell you what circle you're in and what answer to the question you get. So for instance, right now, when I'm told three P is an integer, okay, let's say P is one. Does that follow the rule? Three times one, is that an integer? It sure is. I don't worry about this one right now because I'm only thinking about statement one. Is P an integer? It sure is. Can I find a case where P is not an integer, but my rule is followed? Well, one third. Is three times one third an integer? It sure is. I don't care about this rule right now. P is not an integer. So I don't know if I'm in the integer circle or not. Knowing this, being in this circle, has not clearly put me into a circle in regards to integerness. So statement one is insufficient. So I go to statement two now. Okay. Um, I would need P over three to be an integer. And here's an, an intermediate rule. Sometimes it helps to just start at the rule. If P over three is an integer, okay, let's make P over three one, then P is three. Let's make P over three two, then P is six. Okay, so is P an integer? It is in those cases. Yes, and yes. So can I find a case where it's not an integer? Can I take myself out of the integer circle? Uh, let's try a third, I don't know. Maybe, let's try. A third over three, that's a ninth. That's not, that, that puts me outside of this circle. I have to be in this circle. So since this is not in that circle, one third, you go away. You don't get to play with us. Okay. I have to live in this circle. And if I try to get outside the circle, I'm going to keep finding I, I uh, I'm sorry. If I, if I try to make P not an integer, I'm going to find I'm always outside this circle. And that's no good. I have to be in the circle. And so this is why the answer here is B. So I want you to use this organization here, case rule questions, to do this question here. Uh, so Jen is asking, doesn't P equals one third invalidate B as an answer? See, but you're not understanding what B is. B is not an answer. B is a world we must live in. It tells me I am in a green circle. The green circle is the circle where P over three is an integer. One third is not in the circle, it's over here. So since one third isn't in the green circle, I don't get to play with one third right now. The statements give me the worlds I have to live in. They are the constraints. That's like asking, this is, this is, this is the purpose of today, this question, okay? That's like asking, doesn't the existence of wolves invalidate statement one, right? Doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't the fact that animal P, doesn't animal P being a wolf invalidate statement one as an answer? No, because I don't want, animal P is not a wolf. Statement one tells me it's a bear. I just gotta accept it's a bear. That's the circle I'm stuck in, okay? I don't care about non-bear circles right now. I'm told I'm a bear. I gotta be a bear. What kind of species? I don't know yet. Am I a mammal? Yes, because I'm in the bear circle. So for P over three, I gotta be in the P over three circle. That's the green circle. And it just so happens that the green circle is part of the blue circle. Yeah, so Jenna says it makes sense with words, it gets lost when it starts to numbers, exactly. But you have to keep thinking, like, don't let the abstraction of the numbers confuse you to the logic, because the logic underneath is identical. And that's what's, that's what's so hard about testing cases, is that in certain pro problems, it's confusing enough just to, just to figure out what circle I'm in, right? It's, it takes enough work to think, like, think of numbers that fit this circle. That's already kind of abstract and weird. And as soon as that happens, we forget that we still have to be in the circle. Even though it's hard to figure out what numbers put, what numbers are in the circle, we have to remember that those are the only numbers we're allowed. And numbers that don't fit that situation, we just can't think about. Who cares? Different circle. This is 100%, by the way, the, the 
theme of the day. This is why, why I want to do this, because this is a super common uh, issue, something you definitely want to work on and, and, and understand, because it's huge in data sufficiency. So you use that case rule question organization for this problem here. Go ahead, take two minutes. That's about two minutes. Have an answer in. Let's start making a guess if we're not sure. Test will make you do that. D, D's, A's, D's. And then I have, it seems like some not sures. Don't see a lot of answers coming in after that. Some ease. Okay. So case rule question, all right? And again, sometimes it helps to start with the rule. That can help. So let's say M over three is prime. Okay, so let's say a prime number is two. Let's say M over three is two. That means M is six. I'm not going to worry about this rule right now because I'm just working on statement one. Is M prime? No, it's not. Okay. I want to see if I can find a yes, it is. I want to find a yes case now because if I can find a no in the yes, I know uh, if, if I can find a no in the yes, I know I don't know whether I'm in the prime circle or not. Okay. And okay, well, let's make a uh, M over three. Let's say it's three, that's prime. Then M is nine, but you know, that's not prime either. So shoot, okay, that didn't help me. Uh, let's, so let's make M prime. Uh, let's make M uh, three. Three over three is one. That's not prime. Fun fact about primes, the lowest prime is two. And so since that's not prime, I don't get to live in that world. That's outside of the circle that I must live in. I must follow this rule. So let's try another, since I'm trying to get a prime number for M, let's try five. Five over three, that's not, that breaks the rule. Shit, oh gosh, this is recorded. Oh dear, um, I just got fired, but shoot, <laughs> I can't break the rule. Um, and so I throw five out. And I just, no matter what I try, I can't find a case where M is prime. 
it seems to break the rule of the circle m over three is prime. Please don't fire me. Yeah, bless. Seriously, I'll, I'll see if I'll see if we can do that. Um, oh, the casualness. It's quarantine. I blame the quarantine. I'm going crazy. So I guess, and this is a kind of I guess I guess m is not prime. And I would have to say that statement one is sufficient because I've answered the question. The answer is no, but I answered the question. I have enough information to say no, M is not prime. Okay, interesting. Three divided by one is uh, three divided by three is one, and one is not prime. Anne Marie, three is the three is the one prime number that is divisible by three and ends up at a prime number, right? If I do three m over one is prime, m over three is prime, but one is not prime, so I have to throw you out. It's outside the circle. So uh, D'Alessandro is is asking a fair question, right? Do I need to test cases here? Maybe not. I mean, that's fine, but the exercise today is to practice testing cases, and I want you to have a rich toolkit no matter what. So I know statement one tells me m is not prime. How about statement two? It tells me square root of m is prime. Well, again, let's think of a, let's say square root of m is two. That means m is four. Is m prime? No. Square root of, let's say square root of m is three. m is nine. Is m prime? No. And I'm gonna have a similar problem. I'm not gonna be able to follow, I'm not gonna be able to live in this world and have a prime number for M. Just don't work. The visualization of these circles, M equals two, if, if M is two, the square root of two, is that prime? No, breaks the rule, it's outside the circle. So I don't get to play with two. Okay, the visualization here, Am I in the blue prime circle? That's what the question asks. Statement one tells me I'm in the red M over three is prime circle. And it turns out that that circle, there's no intersection between the blue and the red. They never touch. There's never a case where M is prime and M over three is prime. There's no intersection for that. So since I'm in the red circle, I can say I'm not in the blue circle. Same thing with the green. Okay, if I'm in the green circle, I'm not in the blue circle. If I'm in both circles, just for fun, I'm nine. Nine's the only number that fits both of these rules. But I don't need to get there. I already know I'm not in the blue circle in either case. And so the answer here is D, okay? Yeah, Jenna, make sure you practice your primes, have, have a good sense of what they are and what they aren't, right? One is often thought of as a prime number, but it's not technically, okay. So let's do one more question here, uh, a trickier question, the hardest one we've seen yet. The answer to this question is D. So each, each statement, right, each statement puts me in a circle that doesn't intersect the blue prime circle. There's no situation where I'm in, I know I'm in a red and I know I'm in the green. And that tells me I'm not in the blue. And that's the question, are you in the blue? So the answer here is D. Okay, let's take one last question. It's the hardest one we've seen so far, I think, probably. Test case is very organized. I recommend using some version of case rule question.
So that's about two minutes. See some ease coming in. Okay, that's three minutes here. So final guess here, I have E's, C's, B's. So we know the revenue that they were paid was 5,000 bucks. That's always the, always the case. Revenue is always 5,000 or 500,000, excuse me, 500,000. I would like to know if profit was greater than 150,000, which rephrasing is not a skill we're talking about today, but it's something that's, it's, it's one of the major skills in data sufficiency. If the profit was more than 150,000, what I'm also asking is, was the cost less than 350,000? As long as the costs are less than that, my answer to the question is yes. Once the costs are more than 350,000, the answer to my question is no. Okay. So let's go through the cases here. Let's, okay, the company's total cost was three times its cost for materials. Okay, well, so let's say the materials cost a dollar. One thing you can do in testing cases is test stupid extremes. Then the total cost was $3 and the uh, labor cost would be $2. So that follows my rule, okay? Was profit more than 150,000? Yeah, a lot more. I went to, uh, I have $6, or they have $3 in cost. So yeah, it's more than 150,000, okay? Can I find a case where no, it's not more than 150,000 where the profit is less than 150,000. Sure, I think that, should, that shouldn't be too hard. Let's turn this to 100,000. Same, kind of just scale it up. Then the total is 300,000. The labor, labor is 200,000. Follows the rule. I'm not worried about this one right now because that's statement two. I'll get there in a moment. And so I have a situation where I don't know if I'm in the, which circle I'm in, am I in the, greater than $150,000 profit circle or I'm in the less than, I don't know. Okay, so statement one is insufficient. I know it's not A or D. Now I go to statement two. I don't need to worry about this rule for a moment. This tells me that the profit was greater than its cost of labor. Interesting. We know the total profit is greater than the cost of labor. So let's say labor cost $1, and let's just do the materials cost uh, $2. Okay. Is the profit more than the cost of labor? Yeah, by a lot. Was it more than $150,000? Yeah, by a lot. Okay. Can I get a no? Well, sure. Let's just keep the labor as a dollar. And the material now is $200,000. Or let's know if more than that, let's say $400,000. Okay. I don't need to worry about this rule. Is the profit of about $100,000, right? Because the total cost is basically $400,000. Is the profit greater than the cost of labor? Yeah, because I said it was a $1 labor job. Do I have more than $150,000 in profit? I should have written that question here, 150K in profit. No, I don't. My profit's 100K. Actually, it's 999,999 because I have a $1 of labor cost. So I have a yes case, I have a no case. That's insufficient. 
Statement two does not tell me if I made more or less than $150,000. Now I have to follow all the rules. Okay. Well, let's go back to this case here because I think this is gonna follow both rules. So if the, yeah, so this here, it follows the first rule. And here's the nice thing. I probably shouldn't have put X's here because I just didn't have to follow it. Um, here's the nice thing. Since the profit of almost all of it, the profit is almost $500,000, is more than the labor cost. It follows the second rule as well. It follows that rule. And so I have my yes case. I have my case where they made more than $150,000 in profit. I've, I've lived in both the circles I need to live in by living in here and living in here, I found that I could have over $150,000 in profit. Okay. So now we, we want to see if we can find a case where I don't have $150,000 in profit. Where the answer is no to the question, where the costs are more than 350. Hmm. Okay. So let's say they were, let's say the profit was 150. So let's go to the extreme. Let's say it was not greater than $150,000. Having to organize my thoughts here. Ah. So that means the cost were 350. Okay, and I know there's a three to one ratio of material to labor. And so what this is gonna, this is gonna tell me that labor is gonna be two thirds, this is not the most elegant way of doing this, two thirds of 350,000. And materials would be one third of 350,000, okay. And I'm drawing a blank here because I know this is sufficient, but I feel like I'm not doing a great job organizing this here. So I took a second to get my grounding, those that are watching the recording, okay. Here's the situation. If the profit is 150, then the costs would be 350 and labor would be two thirds of that. It would be two thirds of 350. Well, the problem is that two thirds of 350 is more than 150. And I'm told the profit has to be more than the labor, but two thirds of 350 is a little bit less than 240. And so that breaks the rule. That's not possible. That, that doesn't follow all the circles. That doesn't fit in the circles. And anytime I do this, if I try to make profit even less, okay, that just makes more labor cost. It's two thirds of a higher number. And so I keep getting a world where my profit is not more than my labor. And that means my costs have to be less than 350,000, which means my profit needs to be more than $150,000. By trying to fit in these circles, particularly, yeah, both of them, by trying to fit in these two circles, where this tells me labor, this is another way of saying labor is two thirds the cost. By fitting in these two circles, I always end up with profit more than $150,000. I can't have labor be two thirds the cost and have the profit be more than the labor and be less than $150,000 in profit. The numbers just don't work. And it's pretty tough to get there, but if you're organized, better organized than I was just now, but if you're organized and clear about what, you're, what you need to do, if you know what circles you need to live in, you're gonna find, ah, I'm always above $150,000 in profit, okay? So it's always a game of following the rules, living in this world, these are your worlds. This is the animal P is a bear. Don't worry about not bears. If it's not a bear, you have to throw that case out. If the profit is not more than the labor, 
you have to throw that case out. Okay. Figure out what the bears are and see if that's enough to answer the question that is asked. That's all testing cases is. Okay. So we're going to wrap up our testing cases deep dive. Went into the abstract, pulled back, did some simpler questions, did a harder question. No matter what organization you use, case rule questions. Those are the three parts to keep track of. Um, thank you all for joining. If you would like to check our upcoming classes, you can go to manhattanprep.com slash gmat slash classes. Again, you can try out our first session for free. Um, I will stick around now to answer any questions from those in the audience. I saw some in the chat. I will get to those ASAP. Otherwise, be well, be safe. I will see you all next time.